So for the rest of lecture today, we are going to talk a little bit about the global water cycle. And we will return to the water cycle on Friday for our last lecture uh, before the exam. Now, there isn't really a section about the water cycle in your textbook. So I'm including a short reading uh, from another textbook up on, uh, put it up on Blackboard. So that is available to you. Okay, so the water cycle is pretty simple in many ways. Uh, one of the main fluxes in the water cycle is evaporation. This is the, the flux uh, of water from either aquatic systems like the ocean or land into the atmosphere. So we have evaporation over the ocean and we have evaporation on land. Because uh, the atmosphere has a very limited capacity to hold water, if we consider the whole atmosphere, uh, and because water isn't building up in the atmosphere over time, it's relatively stable, uh, any increase in evaporation in one location uh, is going to have to be balanced out by an equal increase in precipitation uh, somewhere else. And so overall, the amount of water that's being evaporated is going to be equal to the amount of water that is being dropped from the atmosphere in the form of precipitation. So precipitation is a flux of water from the atmosphere uh, to some other uh, pool of water. So water that enters the atmosphere uh, through evaporation is going to eventually be dropped as precipitation, but not necessarily in the same place. So let's look at the ocean versus on land. So if we look at the ocean, the difference in evaporation here versus precipitation, so the amount of water leaving the ocean versus the amount of water coming in to the ocean from the atmosphere, you'll notice they're not in balance. And so there's actually a net loss of water from the ocean when we consider precipitation and evaporation in the ocean system. However, if we look on land, we see the opposite pattern. The amount of precipitation on land is actually greater than the amount of water transferred back to the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration, which remember transpiration is just evaporation from plant surfaces. So if we look at these together, what we see is that there's actually a net movement of water um, from the ocean to land uh, because of the mass movement of air through uh, different air currents. Uh, you get a lot of water being evaporated from the ocean, it gets carried on land. And so there's a net transfer of water from the ocean to our terrestrial systems. Uh, but of course, the amount of water on land isn't building up over time. It's relatively stable. And so this excess of precipitation relative to transpiration ends up getting balanced by the flow of water back into the ocean uh, through things like runoff uh, that brings water into rivers, which then carry that water out back to the ocean. Uh, so that is uh, what we re refer to as surface flow. Um, but then there's also some water that percolates into groundwater. And this too eventually uh, can end up back in the ocean as well. And because the oceans at least until more recently, haven't been accumulating water and the land hasn't been accumulating water or losing water, these processes basically balance each, each other out. Now, if we consider the water balance of terrestrial systems, um, we can think about 
the water, uh, the water cycle in these systems, and these are going to be governed. The water, uh, water cycle within a terrestrial system is going to be governed by the laws of mass balance, meaning what goes in has to be equal to what goes out if the size of that pool is going to stay the same over time. So what does this mean? Well, this means that if the amount of water in a terrestrial system isn't changing over time, then the amount of water coming in, which is equal largely just to precipitation, that flux in is going to be equal to the fluxes out. And the fluxes out of a terrestrial system are evapotranspiration, which we often abbreviate as ET. Evapotranspiration is just the combination of evaporation and transpiration. So precipitation is equal to evapotranspiration plus runoff, water uh, lost from the ecosystem as water travels and moves. And then lastly, um, it's also anything that gets added to water storage. So I've just written this delta here. That just means the change, change in water storage. So how much is being stored by the, by the ecosystem, the change in storage. Now it turns out that this term is generally pretty small. Um, and on an annual basis is often negligible. Uh, so very small. And so often uh, we can just ignore that term. And in this case, precipitation is approximately equal to evapotranspiration plus runoff. And so if precipitation is generally approximately equal to evapotranspiration plus runoff, which includes percolation downward through the soil, uh, then that means that the more water that we have that gets evapotranspired, uh, the less is going to leave that ecosystem in runoff. And this is just a consequence of mass balance. Um, and this, it turns out, has a lot of consequences, and we'll talk a little more about that in the next lecture. But because we care often about how much runoff or transpiration there is, um, one of the main issues for understanding the water balance of a site uh, is to understand what controls the processes like evapotranspiration. What controls how much of the water that enters a system through precipitation, ends up leaving the system uh, as evapotranspired water. And there, of course, are physical factors that are going to affect this rate of evapotranspiration. Uh, usually the climate, how, how warm is it? That's going to affect evapotranspiration. But there are biological controls on this process too. And as such, those are of interest to us as ecologists. Now, it turns out that one of the strongest biological controls on evapotranspiration is the total amount of leaf area in an ecosystem. And we usually define uh, the total amount of leaf area or describe the total amount of leaf area in an ecosystem based on something called the leaf area index or LAI. Uh, and this is just the total leaf area above one meter squared of ground. So it has the units of meter squares of leaf area per meter squared of ground. And as an example, uh, you could have two different systems one with an LAI of one, in this case, over one meter squared of ground, you have one meter square of leaf area. But because in many places you can have leaves sort of uh, 
piled up on top of each other. You have a lower level of leaves in the lower canopy, but maybe you have some taller plants that are producing leaves above that. And so you can end up with a much higher leaf area index and a higher area of leaf surface than you do ground surface. So for example, here, uh, an LAI of three, a leaf area index of three is over one meter square ground surface you essentially have three um, meters squared leaf area all combined um, just because they're sort of layered over top of each other. Um, you get a lot more leaf area than you do ground area. Now, why is it leaf area that matters uh, when it comes to evapotranspiration and not all plant surfaces? Well, the answer is that not all plant surfaces have stomata. Uh, lots of plant parts like stems, especially if you think of woody plants that are covered in thick bark, they don't have stomata, so they're not losing water. They're not transpiring water through all those plant surfaces. Instead, water is uh, mainly just being transpired uh, through the leaf tissue, which has those stomatal pores uh, through which uh, water can escape and of course through which co2 can enter and again that co2 from the atmosphere is what will provide the bulk of the biomass for an organism and that's where plants uh, get their carbon from from co2 coming in through the stomata from the atmosphere so the amount of evapotranspiration depends on the leaf area index of an ecosystem. And ecosystems can vary a lot uh, in terms of their LAI. So for example, a typical grassland may have an LAI of three meters squared. And that probably should really be per meter squared of ground area. Whereas a typical forest, um, although they vary a lot, may have an LAI more like six meters squared leaf area per meter squared uh, of land surface. And so in a case like this, we expect much more evapotranspiration from a forest than we do a grassland because there's just a lot more leaf area uh, for evapotranspiration to occur from. And it also turns out that evapotranspiration of a forest, which has that high LAI, uh, is generally going to be much higher than evaporation from bare soil or even evaporation uh, from an open water like a pond uh, because, again, there's just much more surface area as you have all those layers of leaves over which water can be evaporated from. A pond is all water uh, at the surface, but it only has one meter squared of surface to evaporate water. It can't evaporate water at the depths of, of the lake. It's just there at the surface. Um, but a forest has six or sometimes even higher meters squared over a meter square of ground. And so that's just a lot more potential surface for water to evaporate from. Now, the second reason uh, that things like a forest or a grassland can tend to have much higher evaporation or evapotranspiration than bare ground is that plants often have pretty deep root systems. And so they're able to pull water way up from the deep soil um, that wouldn't be evaporated from, from bare soil since evaporation is just evaporating water right there at the top. And so ultimately, this means that ecosystems that have higher LAI uh, given an equal amount of precipitation, they are going to have more of that precipitation eventually lost or transferred back to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. And as a result, uh, they're going to tend to have less water lost in the form of runoff. So less water leaving uh, that, those ecosystems in runoff or percolating out of the soil.
And so the amount of evapotranspiration is going to vary a lot between systems, and this ends up having uh, some pretty substantial consequences. And we're going to talk about those, what those, some of those consequences are next time. So that brings us to the end of lecture for today. And I will just leave you with uh, a couple of questions. So first of all, what are some ways in which the phosphorus cycle differs from the nitrogen cycle? And what is one way in which it is similar? Then regarding the uh, water cycle uh, question, you should be able to answer now. Which part of the nature reserve, uh, the Jewel Moore Nature Reserve here on campus, is going to have higher rates of evapotranspiration, the prairie or the forest? And why is that? And then finally, uh, back uh, regarding the first part of the lecture, why do wetlands tend to have high rates of denitrification? Uh, what about wetlands lends themselves well uh, to the process of denitrification? And how is this relevant to preventing dead zones in the ocean? Okay, so those are your end of lecture questions. Uh, we will finish up with the water cycle and talk a little bit about disturbance and nutrient cycles in our next lecture on Friday, which will be the last lecture before our third exam.